Happy Monday, Seattle hockey fans. Oh, have we got a lot to talk about. And hopefully there will be some light at the end of this tunnel for the Seattle Kraken. Let's get into it ahead of tomorrow's game day on this episode of Locked on Kraken. You are Locked on Kraken. Your daily podcast on the Seattle Kraken. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. We are the Seattle Kraken. Hey, hey, what do you say, Seattle hockey fans? Welcome to another episode of Locked on Kraken, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, where we bring you your favorite team every single day. Today's episode of Locked on Kraken is brought to you by Sleeper. Download the Sleeper app and use promo code Locked on NHL to get up to a $100 match on your first deposit. Of course, terms and conditions will apply, and you can see the sleepers' terms of use for more details. All right, Seattle Kraken fans, it's a Monday. Generally speaking, it's a reset, a new week. The Seattle Kraken have already traveled to Detroit for their next game. Daniel Sprung revenge game question mark. We'll get into that on tomorrow's episode. Don't worry because um, it's going to be a good topic, but we have a lot to get into. And unfortunately it starts with a bit of bad news to remix too many men and their bit of news segment. But Andre Burakovsky listed as out for six to eight weeks. Jeff Baker wrote an article about this. We're actually going to get into that in a little bit. But here's the official word from the Seattle Kraken. Injury update on hashtag Kraken forward Andre Burakovsky. That came um, earlier this morning, officially, officially. But the word on the street, my good man, and... The word on the street, my friends, is, quote, Andre Burakovsky is expected to miss six to eight weeks after undergoing a successful procedure to address an upper body injury uh, that occurred in the game versus the New York Rangers on October 21st. Successful procedure. Is that a surgery? Is that a kind of cleaning out of something? Upper body injury. A lot of people who were at the game reporting that he looked to be holding his kind of shoulder collarbone area. This is a blow for so many different reasons that we are definitely going to get into. But as I mentioned, I first heard the news or read the news from our good man, Jeff Baker. This is what he wrote um, yesterday afternoon. It published a Kraken team that departed Sunday for a four city cross continental road trip will be without forward Andre Burakovsky for six to eight weeks. This reporting from Jeff Baker came from a conversation that he had with our general manager, Ron Francis. Now, before I get into the Ron Francis quotes worth noting, that Dave Haxtell, after the game, we'll get into the game a little bit, but we're really going to focus on the, the the ramifications and repercussions of the, the Burakovsky injury and some of the other things that happened in the loss to the Rangers, a 4-1 loss to the Rangers. So we did not string together a winning streak as I was hoping with our Seattle Kraken, or I should say locked on Kraken insiders via subtext. Also, to add insult to injury, I don't have the button bag with me right now, but the button bag had actually picked Andre Burakovsky as our player of the of the game for that game against the Rangers. Needless to say, I will be saging and smudging a lot for tomorrow. But again, I don't want to get into tomorrow. We don't want to get ahead of ourselves. Let's just focus on the news. So Dave Haxtell said that he did not expect it would be short term. So he gave us a little double negative there. Andre Burakovsky got, it was a boarding penalty. He goes into the boards upper body first 
and did not return from the game. Now, there was something else, and I made a little light pun uh, earlier in the episode. We're going to get to all of that, but I wanted to start with Burakovsky because I do think that this is going to have some, some pretty massive implications. So that's what Dave Haxtell said. Didn't seem like it was going to be short term. This is what Ron Francis said per Jeff Baker in the Seattle Times. Quote, from early indications, it looks like he'll be out six to eight weeks, Francis said. We'll have more details on that in a bit. The team did practice today. I'm recording before we have any official word from practice. At least last I checked, they are still practicing. I definitely have some thoughts on practice and conditioning, and we're going to get into that with a new tool that the NHL released. Um, Francis, at the time that Jeff Baker spoke to him, said he had not spoken to Dave Haxtell regarding call-ups. Now, remember, they already have Devin Shore, who's been a healthy scratch. They called him up after the injury to Brandon Tanev that then, of course, slotted Ty Cartier into the lineup. The article goes on to say, and this is not something that I think any of us should be surprised about, but Devin Shore will probably slot in to Cartier's spot and Cartier will move up to Burakovsky's spot. Now, remember on the last episode of Locked On Kraken brought to you by the Locked On Podcast Network, we talked about what the the um, change was looking like. So Burakovsky used to be with Schwartz and Wenberg, but then he ends up with Tolvanen and Gord and Bjorkstrand moves up. So are they going to bring Ali back with Tolvanen and Gord? That's been my favorite line overall holistically in this season. So some decisions for the Seattle Kraken to make, including are they going to bring up another player? And of course, who would that player be? In the conversation that Jeff Baker had with Ron Francis, kind of sounded like they wanted to get through Detroit I'm just looking over here. So it's Detroit, Carolina, Florida, and Tampa Bay. This is a road trip with a day in between each of those games. So where do you want, um, you know, we we had that 7-4 victory over Carolina. Haven't played Florida yet, but that's a team, obviously, that, that went pretty deep into the playoffs last year. Detroit's going to be a good team. We're going to talk about them next year. And Tampa Bay is always kind of pesky. So we're going to get into some of the, the details throughout the week about those individual teams, but it's a road trip. The Seattle Kraken only have one outright win on the season. Couldn't really get anything much going, or I should say weren't consistent with what they were able to get going against the Rangers. So there's a lot of questions. And I think we have to talk about how much of this is questions with just kind of the will and the work ethic and the drive of the team, which we haven't really seen from the Seattle Kraken squad, at least not for what seems to me like the longest stretch of just an inability to get things going, except for, of course, the first season. Um, or is this a personnel issue? And if you are an everydayer, if you are an OG, or you know I had a lot, I've always had questions defensively about this team that I think are manifested in what we see in goaltending but personnel, we didn't, you know, the quick math, this is before like, you know, girl math or hockey math was a thing on social media. We were doing some pretty basic math and the math was showing that we didn't, we didn't make up the goals that we, that we let, a, let walk out the door between Daniel Sprung, who we'll see tomorrow, Morgan Geeky and Ryan Donato. All three of them have adjusted pretty well to their new teams, I would argue, and they were the main reason that the Seattle Kraken, alongside Martin Jones, also out the door, who were able to keep the Seattle Kraken afloat even while things weren't clicking on all cylinders. So needless to say, can can you feel, do you feel as I feel that there are a lot of questions that we have to answer? There are already people shipping off certain players like Jordan Eberle and B. 
Because if it continues this way, we've talked about this so much in the off season. I talked about it in preseason. If the Seattle Kraken can't right the ship, then yeah, some drastic moves need to be made. That's where I'm of the opinion that's where the Seattle Kraken are. I think we have a short leash. I think if things aren't clicking, if people aren't buying in, then we have to make some moves. Are we getting close to that? I guess that's the question. How deep into, once we finish this road trip, we're through the first month. But if you can't scratch a few wins, you know, eight points up for grabs outright, how many points is the Seattle Kraken going to end with by the time we get to the end of October? What do we need? What is reasonable for how we've been playing? These are all questions that we have to answer. But hopefully, while the Seattle Kraken are trying to figure that out on the road, everyone back at Climate Pledge Arena can figure out what happened with the lights. That will be coming up on today's Monday episode of Locked on Kraken. All right, Seattle Kraken fans, I want to talk to you about the Sleeper app. The Sleeper app is a daily fantasy hockey app that you can engage with. You can pick your favorite players, of course, from the Seattle Kraken and league-wide. You can look at things like goals, assists, saves, and plus-minus, so much more. And the great thing is that if you check out the Sleeper app right now, you have a chance to win 100 times your money by playing daily fantasy hockey on the sleeper app. That's right. 100 times your money by playing daily, daily fantasy hockey, excuse me, on the sleeper app. There's so many different scenarios that you can choose from. Again, you have your plethora of amazing players who are, who's on hat trick watch, uh, team that is primed to make a strong run for the Stanley cup. The Seattle Kraken, we got a little work to do to be one of those. But there's so many great players on the Kraken. We're still looking to see what Maddie Beniers is going to do. Uh, I do think that that Tolvanen, uh, Gord, and is it going to be Bjorkstrand now? Or are we going to see Ty Cartier? Uh, that's a line that I'm looking for. But also, you've got Crosby. You've got Makar. We know that. McDavid looks like he's going to be out for a little bit. But there's so many other amazing players in the National Hockey League that can help you win some money on the Sleeper app. So choose your players wisely so you can 100x your payout on sleeper so make sure you're paying attention by listening of course to locked on kraken and the locked on network to help make your picks and because we love that you are an everydayer an og not just to locked on kraken but to the locked on nhl network we are giving you promo code locked on nhl and that will get you up to a 100 dollar match on your first deposit on the sleeper app Terms and conditions do apply, but don't forget that promo code locked on NHL for 100 uh, up to a $100 match on your first deposit on the Sleeper app. The Sleeper terms of see Sleeper terms of use for more details. Okay, Kraken fans, this is where we dig deep to defend the deep. We got to hold fast. We got to stay true. And we also got to get our Climate Pledge Arena working effectively. I'm getting off the plane. I told those who are uh, a part of the Locked on Kraken Insider Community subtext, which I'll tell you about in a little bit. I was traveling during this game, so I wasn't able to see it live, but we had just landed and I was able to watch what I thought was going to be the first few minutes of the first period. And much to my surprise, I was not watching hockey. Instead, I was listening to Eddie Olchek, a.k.a. Enzo, tell me that he carries light bulbs? That was so strange. For context, the light show, as many arenas do, at Climate Pledge Arena, right as the Seattle Kraken are being announced, of course, it goes dark. You've got the whole, you know, the tentacle coming out of the ice and everything like that. Well, after that, 
and I can't speak to before because I was not in the arena, but after all of that, after kind of the opening show, it was noticeably dark as someone watching. It was noticeably dark in the arena, particularly on the side where, as it would turn out, the visiting goaltender, Jonathan Quick, uh, I guess it would have been to his left-hand side, that left-hand corner that was just darker. It was darker than everywhere else on the ice. And it was almost like an ombre, as I like to say, an ombre effect where it was just darker on the side of the ice where the Rangers were defending. And then it was the brightness that you expect over where Philip Grubauer and the Seattle Kraken would be defending. I'm going to read you the statement and then we'll get into what happens. But quote, there was an electrical issue with the arena lighting grid that at the time I got this message, is currently being evaluated. The team's goaltenders will switch nets after the 10-minute mark in each period to accommodate. So that's unfortunate. There was a delay. And then there's multiple interruptions in the game so that the goaltenders and the netminders are switching. So not one netminder is dealing with the darkness over the other. And this led to just a strange cadence to this game. The Seattle Kraken felt that they started off really strong. And if you were listening to the broadcast, they mentioned that multiple times. But after the game, Justin Schultz, who scored the first and lone goal in the 4-1 loss to the Rangers, as well as Jared McCann, made no excuses for the lights. That's Dave Haxtell also spoke to media after the game, and he said more or less the same thing. It was something that both teams had just had to deal with. You just have to deal with it. It's super strange. Jonathan Quick had a really funny quote where he said something. He was asked about the lighting, and he said, well, I just figured since, you know, they play at Climate Pledge Arena, it was like an energy-saving tactic or something. So well played, Jonathan Quick, well played, not just with your joke, but, of course, on the ice. Jonathan Quick um, really uh, deflated any hopes that the Seattle Kraken had late in the game. I was particularly zoned in on the third period, and I just thought Jonathan Quick made some stellar, stellar saves. That being said, Enzo has said this before, and again, if you're part of the subtext community, a.k.a. the Locked On Kraken Insiders, you've heard me say this before as well in our game day threads. The Seattle Kraken have to lift the puck. <laughs> you have to lift the puck. You have to get the goaltender moving laterally. You have to get bodies in front of net. And arguably, that's something that the Seattle Kraken are just not doing enough not doing enough. And I want to go back to the Jeff Baker article just for a moment, because another thing that Jeff mentions in his article, it has to do with um, kind of enforcers. And between the game against, I guess it was Carolina, but then also uh, the game in Colorado, basically all season and arguably last season as well, a lot of people are making the argument that maybe the Seattle Kraken just aren't tough enough physically. Yanni Gord got a a, a, a game misconduct. That was ridiculous. I think Nick Olchek went on a rant post game after that, but I agree with him. He definitely. You saw a player, I forget who off the bench kind of jabbing at Yanni Gord, who is naturally going to respond. And then he gets cross checked twice blinded, you know? And anyway, I mean, there was just a lot going on in this game, and it wasn't all good. <laughs> Let's take a look at the game recap, the stats. We have this lovely new um, graphic that we have that sometimes I'm able to put up on social media. But you can see 4-1 win for the Rangers. They had 27 shots on goal to our 19. We're still really good on the penalty kill. Struggling, though, on the power play. Sorry, Dave Haxtell. I know you don't like to say that the, the power play is struggling, but it kind of is. You can see face-offs there. The, tw the penalty minutes obviously increased for that game misconduct for Yanni Gord on our side. And then you can see the hits there. So a physical game, a lot of people wondering, including Jeff Baker in, in that article where he's talking about Burakovsky, 
what happens? We're going to see, you know, the Rangers again. Uh, is it next month or in? I'm taking a quick look. I don't remember off. The, we're going to see them in January. Okay. So we're going to see them in January. What is realistic for the Seattle Kraken when it comes to, I'm using air quotes for those listening on audio, enforcement? We've talked about the physicality. The Seattle Kraken don't have a physical presence. Not in that way. We're kind of more grit blue collar. Yanni Gord's never going to back down. I mean, it was kind of laughable to see Jared McCann go after someone. Jeff Baker me mentions in his article that no one, Kale McCarr did not have to, other than the fans booing him, have to be held uh, to account for his hit on Jared McCann. If you're an everyday or if you're an OG or you know that I don't really see the point of hitting in hockey. I mean, as in some of this enforcer kind of stuff, I think you play physical, you play aggressive, and there's a way that you can do that and you can send a message without necessarily having to drop the gloves. Dropping the gloves is just one of the silliest things to me. It makes no sense. Now, if you put on a good hit, maybe it even does lead to a penalty and someone takes exception to it and they want to drop the gloves. I mean, as a baseball fan, I somewhat understand it. But I think it's also silly that, you know, Jared McCann talks about, I guess there's like this thing. I mean, I know because I've seen it in hockey. I've heard hockey players. But I'm saying, I guess, in that it doesn't make any sense to me cognitively why you would. It's like slapping someone, you know, in the face with a glove and being like, I challenge you to a duel. I think that's so silly. I think it's so silly. Uh, I, If I had to guess, I really don't know the culture of that. If I had to guess, it's because the guys want to make a point, but also not take the, the guy off guard. Uh, uh, again, hockey culture, when it comes to that, I'm very ignorant to it. Other sports that I cover that I've played, if you're going to go after someone, you, you go after them. Everyone who puts on a cheap hit or who puts on a hit where another player is injured, you should be expecting retaliation, in my opinion, in sports, generally speaking. But to be like having a conversation while the puck's dropping, like, are you ready? Like, are, you, are we going to do this? To, I just, I, what? That's leaning more into the entertainment value of, of a fight as opposed to the practicality of protecting your teammates, in my opinion. I would argue that not a lot of hockey fans would agree with me, but if we really think about it, what the what the freak are we doing? You're going to warn a guy who gave your teammate no warning when he went after him, and you're going to give him the dignity, the respect, and honestly, the choice. The choice, right? Because McCann in his... In his um, comments post game he actually says that he tried to do that against Colorado or maybe it was uh, he talks about McCann definitely talked about in his post game comments against the Rangers like hey are we going off or are we squaring off but Jeff Baker mentions in his article that's what it was that McCann perhaps was also trying to to get it going in that Colorado series that's so silly to me that's so it's a waste of time. It's a waste of focus. And to me, you're going to send someone an invitation to a fight. I, I don't, I don't get it. I don't get it. What I do get is that the Kraken are not a physical team. We're not a big team. And Jeff Baker makes a point, which I've made in the past as well. Does this make us a target? McCann and Beneers were definitely a target in, in the postseason. I think Ty Cartier in the preseason got a little bit of his licks as well, even in the postseason after a while. So they're going to go after the younger guys, the, the smaller guys, and, of course, the more of the finesse guys. And that's, if that's what you got to do to win hockey games, I guess, go for it. So how are... How is Seattle going to respond? To me, I don't want to see them do this enforcer foolishness. I just don't. <laughs> We're not good at it. It's silly. It takes away from the game. And the Seattle Kraken have plenty 
to focus on. And that's what we're going to talk about next. And we're going to use a new data, um, a new data tool. It's actually coming from the National Hockey League. NHL Edge. I took a look at it. I definitely have some feedback and comments, uh, but overall, I want to talk about where do we go from here, including the physicality element, because we just don't have it. But also now we're down bodies, so you got to make sure that other teams aren't taking a run at your team. But how can we do that within the skill set that the Seattle Kraken have At the present, we're going to talk about it. That's what's coming up on Locked on Kraken. Today's episode of Locked on Kraken also brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. All things that we need as Seattle Kraken fans. But also, that's what brings home the winning trophy and is what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance from superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED lights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, ooh, we're also going to get into this coming up next on Locked on Kraken. eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with the eBay guaranteed fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. And We know we need some wins over with the Seattle Kraken. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit only available to U.S. customers. Okay, Kraken fans. (laughs) It's been a tough couple of days. Burakovsky news, not great. Dropping another game, not great. I mean, the Carolina game, there was a lot of promise there. We've got, we got Belmar involved, Cartier involved. I mean, so many guys were getting involved. We scored seven freaking goals, but that seems the exception and not the rule. So what do we know and where do we go from here? We need some wins, folks. I told you we've got four games on the road to close out this month, this first month of the season. That's four games Two points if we win outright per game. So that's eight points. Out of eight points, how many points do you think are realistic? That's the question of the day. Question of the day today, how many points are realistic in the next four games? That's a great question, and I don't know that I have an answer. I don't know that I have a prediction. What do we need? Well, this is when we have to take a look at some of our other bottom dwellers, if you will. We uh, are in, you know, the company that we don't want. We don't want to be at the bottom. We don't want to be struggling. But if you look at the league overall, you've got someone from the Pacific Division, the big, bad Vegas Golden Knights, 6-0 and with 12 points. The Seattle Kraken right now are 30th overall in the National Hockey League, just in case you forgot, which, of course, you didn't. There are only 32 teams. The two teams behind us, also in the Pacific Division, Anaheim Ducks, who are 1-4-0 with two points, and the San Jose Sharks, who are 0-4-1, just the one point. We are directly behind the Edmonton Oilers. I alluded to it, but Connor McDavid perhaps out for a couple of weeks, a few weeks with an injury. In five games, they are 1-3-1, and one, so with three points. Capitals, Blackhawks, Jets, uh, we're looking up at them as well. When it comes to just the division, let's again go over this briefly. The Seattle Kraken, six out of eight in our division, obviously the Vegas Golden Knights at the top, the Canucks, the Kings, and the Flames round out the top four. But what else are we seeing? We have a minus 10 goal differential. The only team that has a worse goal differential in our division, the San Jose Sharks, at a minus 13. Best team in the league, 
best team in our conference. They are one in the same. That's the Vegas Golden Knights. They're running with a plus 14 goal differential. But let's just go to points because I asked you question of the day. How many of these eight points? I'm, I'm pointing over here because that's where my big schedule is. Out of the eight points that we have potential to gain in the month of October, how many of those points do we realistically need? Well, if we want to be in playoff contention, obviously getting closer to the top four as opposed to being in the bottom four is going to be better. So you need at least, I'd say, two, two to four points to leapfrog Edmonton and get in contention with Calgary. That's just, I mean, you got to have that. I feel like you've got, we've got to get another win. That's like, just for morale, right? We got to get another win. If we get another win and everything stays the same for Edmonton, we would leapfrog them. And then we would be in that five point range with Calgary and LA. Now out of these teams, again, we're playing Detroit, Carolina. We've already had some success against Carolina, but with Burkowski out, you know, morale, not necessarily where we want it. You can't guarantee that. Then you've got Florida, Tampa Bay. Those are going to be tough. So I think you want to go after Carolina. Detroit's going to be tough. That's our game tomorrow. We'll talk about it a little bit. But if you can get at least two points, I would love it to be a win. But you can get that also by a shootout OT loss. Don't love it. I think we need to win games outright. So, I mean, it seems kind of silly, but... I think getting a win or getting two points in any fashion for me is basement. I don't think that is nearly enough. I don't think you can continually play. You can't keep the trend of playing four games and only getting two points out of four games, two points out of a, a potential eight. We can't keep that trend going. It's unsustainable if the Seattle Kraken team wants to build on what they did last year. But now the question becomes, do we even really know what built our success? And arguably, do we even have what helped build our success? I've talked about it before, and you know I am pissed that we did not get Martin Jones in exit interviews. He was key to our success early. We got to keep it funky. As of right now, the only goaltender on our team who has helped us get a point, Joey Decord. This is like a rinse and repeat, man. It's a rinse and repeat. And I want to go to the NHL Edge. So NHL Edge, just I want to read this quickly, and then I'll give you my thoughts on it. Um, but NHL brings fans closer to the game with the launch of NHL edge advanced stats section on NHL.com. I feel like I've mentioned it a few times. I've definitely said it out loud to myself, the new NHL website, not feeling it. The game logs, I actually have less information easily accessible to me than what we had last year. Don't like that. I love the concept of NHL edge because I can tell you by looking at NHL edge earlier today, that the Seattle Kraken are below the 50th percentile in multiple categories, including goals, which is not surprising, shooting percentage. We have a sub 7% shooting percentage. The league average is almost 10, 9.9%. So we're below the 50th percentile there. Speed bursts. So how many times, if I, if I remember the definition correctly, correctly, how many times and for how long are, is any given player on the Seattle Kraken at 14 miles per hour, per hour or above? So we are below average there. We're at a 10.7%, 10.9. So not by much, but, and then we're also below average on top skating speed. We're in the 59th percentile when it comes to offensive zone time. We're at a 42, 41.2 clip. League average is um, 40.6. Um, and, and so, again, I think these are really interesting. It also shows you I would show it to you, but and I plan to. I should have taken screenshots because navigating and toggling on NHL edge, maybe it's just because I went on very close to when we got the email announcing it. 
but it's been glitchy to say the least. It's not uploading quickly. It's not easy. Even with the explainer videos, like I would go to one video and then I went to click another, I'd have to refresh the page. Sometimes toggle back, go back to the video section just so I could click on the next video. So I'm hoping this, these are just glitches perhaps early on as people are experimenting and testing with it. Great potential, not great user-friendly capability right now. But what's also not great are some of these numbers. And I'm hoping that we can get an expert. Wonder if you can guess who that might be. Friend of the pod, I think, other than perhaps Jason Hernandez and Ann Kimmel, who are all in the Locked On Network, uh, this person has probably been on Locked On Kraken the most out of anyone. And they are uh, a data-driven storyteller. Any guesses? Any guesses? I feel like if you're an everyday or if you're an OG or and if you're a Seattle Kraken fan, you probably know who I'm talking about. But the question that I have had and what I think this data could unlock, if you have been listening in the offseason and even in preseason, you know that I have been very concerned and wanting to quantify and figure out how do you measure conditioning? And I think NHL Edge might be the way we can do that. So some of this data, just to go back, NHL Edge is giving public, the public, so you and me, access to some, not all, but some of the data points that teams have access to. So this, I think, is really going to help us put into context what we're seeing from the results side. When I look here also on my schedule, I write the results. So that's why you see me pointing over here. Um, for those watching on YouTube, hi YouTubers for you on audio, you're like, I don't know what you're pointing at and that's just fine. But it's something to the left uh, and a little higher than my eyesight, but it, it's, it's the schedule. But um. I want to put it into context. We're also going to be able to look at where are we when it comes to high danger shots? How many high danger shots are we taking? I can tell you the Seattle Kraken. I didn't write those percentages and what percentile we're in, but not looking great for the Seattle Kraken and it has a gradient where you can kind of see low slot, high slot from the outside. And I want to play around with that because if you remember the other day, I mentioned that Dave Haxtell felt that we were letting opponents on the inside too much. And now we can use in theory NHL edge for me to show you that when you're watching on YouTube and to explain it with some numbers not just what Dave Haxel is saying, not that I, I, I mean, he would know, right? But this is maybe some of the data points that the Seattle Kraken are looking like when he's making those comments, which he's made, he's made them before he made them last year. I think everybody was getting everywhere in, in season number one. So I'm looking forward to playing around with this. Gotta tell you right now, it's not perfect. I spent mm, maybe an hour earlier today, mucking through this, looking at the videos just to make sure that I could explain it correctly um, and not great user uh, experience right now. But that's kind of how I feel about the NHL.com. That's how I feel about NHL.com right now. We've got some work to do. We've got some work to do. The best thing that we have in our advantage is that the season is still fresh. It's still new and we will adjust I should say, I hope we adjust because the adjustments have been slow, slower than I feel that they have been in the past. This is just kind of a, a vibe check, a gut check, an eye test kind of thing, if you will. For whatever reason, I think that we're adjusting slower. And that's where the concern comes because the adjustments have to be swift. Yes, I agree with Dave Haxel, and he says our shooting percentage is going to be 2% the whole season. We saw that jump up in the very next game. But when we see numbers like the Seattle Kraken, um, when it comes to skating distance, have some of the, the, the higher numbers when it comes to skating distance, but lowest numbers when it comes to effectively the results, when it comes to defending on the power play or when it comes to uh, scoring on the power play, when it comes to our shot 
chances overall. And the shot, the shooting percentage, just to be clear, is a shot that was either saved or a shot that was, um, that goes in. So the save percent, it doesn't count block shots and stuff like that. So we're, we've got high skating distance. It's a, one of our higher percentile metrics for, uh, on NHL edge. To me, that's a good thing, right? And they talk about like some of the top skaters and their skating distance. And, you know, again, not only skating distance, but how much percentage are we spending in particular zones? All, you know, um, all scenarios, even strength, power play, PK. For me, to have high skating distance, but low numbers when it comes to effectively things like shooting percentage and goals, that tells me that we're doing work, but it's kind of busy work. It's not effective. It's not efficient. We are not an efficient, <laughs> and I am not an efficient host because I probably could have just said that and you knew what I was talking about. <laughs> I'm painting a picture here, people. We're not an efficient team right now. We're just not. A lot of output, high skating distance, high percentile skating distance, low efficiency, low shot percentage, low goals outright. How long before we need to make some thought out changes to the lineup, uh, changes to the approach, changes to the personnel to get that efficiency up? Or does the team need more practice. Shooters going to shoot, right? Some of the greatest shooters, any sport where you shoot or kick or throw, you get your accurate accuracy and efficiency up through repetition. Yes, you need rest, but you have to work those muscles so that it's second nature. You could shoot a puck in your sleep. And when we see the crack in not shooting high, when we see the crack in shooting into bodies of, of the opponents, something in the second nature mechanism is needs to be adjusted or refined. I don't have to be a hockey expert. I don't even have to go to, you know, NHL edge to know that we've been talking about it. But these numbers in handy dandy notebook, they really bring home uh, what needs to be done. Adjustments need to be made. I, I go back and forth on how much I think personnel is the issue. Some of that's out of our hands with two guys down with injury. So for me, the only way that you get your efficiency up is to get your touch back. How do you get your touch back? By doing repetitions. When do you do repetitions with no consequences effectively? In practice. In practice. Let's try and get an expert in here. Help me break this down and talk some hockey analytics and maybe unlock what is needed to right the ship so that we can defend the deep. It is high time. We cannot end this part of the season with any less than two points. And that's really, that's even that's not good enough to be honest, but we certainly can't go a goose egg. We can't go an offer. That's our show, folks. Tomorrow is a game day episode, so we'll dive into a little bit more about our opponent, the Detroit Red Wings. We got we got some work to do. I have I have not lost faith. I just need to see a little bit more sandpaper. I need to see someone step it up. I need to see someone take ownership and light a spark. We're without a spark. We're without our Donnie boy. We're without our Spronger. 
without, uh, you know, you can't out pizza the hut geeky. Right now, those things are, they seem to matter. Belmar is a good guy in the locker room. I really like that about him. Philip Grubauer, ugh, again, NHL edge. There's some data points that I want to look into when it comes to high danger chances. I do think he's being left out to dry, but there are goalies who can make high danger stops. And where does Philip Grubauer stand when it comes to those goalies, statistically speaking? We, we have to talk about it. I'm sorry. I know the Gru crew. You're going to be upset, but we have to talk about it. And honestly, I test and my gut feeling is telling me maybe Joy Dax does a little bit better in those scenarios. Maybe we need to look at where the Seattle Kraken are playing, how much time they're spending in the defensive zone versus the neutral zone versus the offensive zone when it's Grubauer versus Joey Dax, Joey Decord. Very small sample size for Joey Dax, but it's worth looking at. So hopefully they'll fix the glitches on NHL Edge. Hopefully we'll get our expert on here so we can talk about it. Until then, be kind to yourself. Let's be kind to our team but also be real. And of course, let's be kind to each other. We got to hold fast. We have got to stay true. And tomorrow we say loud and proud after I sage and smudge. Let's go Kraken. I'll catch you on the next episode of Locked on Kraken. Erga El Ayala, your host, saying peace. And enjoy the rest of your day.